From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. K-State beef specialist Dale Blossy says that cattle producers, especially in western Kansas, are experiencing abnormally dry conditions, and that may result in a lack of available forage. As a result, he says they're going to have to be ready to make some quick decisions. Also, K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth is getting calls from soybean growers asking about some early season pests, something that he says routinely happens this time of year because those pests are more noticeable. And K-State horticulturist Ward Upham has information on why some gardeners might be having trouble with vegetables that are blooming but not setting fruit. He says there are several possible explanations. It's all just ahead on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Reduced forage availability across Kansas is prompting cow-calf producers to evaluate their options for making strategic adjustments. K-State beef cattle specialist Dale Blossy says that producers in western Kansas are experiencing abnormally dry conditions and they're going to have to be ready to make some quick decisions about cow-calf nutrition and management. Well, Jeff, I hail from eastern Colorado and I know in the along the Colorado-Nebraska line it's... Uh, Severely exceptional drought, uh, not a stitch of grass available, and as a consequence, many of the local auction markets have seen uh, large runs of pairs, of cow-calf pairs, being moved completely out of the country. So as a result, then, they're having to either come up with a supplementation regimen or they are having to move the cattle. Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing huge marketings of cow-calf pairs, and uh, really the, the base is actually forage, hay, and uh, it's just not a very optimistic viewpoint looking as we go into the winter in the next three or four months. The idea is we need to come up with something that is going to be high in energy and high in protein, but also fit into the overall economic management budget of the farm. Absolutely. And and if there's uh, a reduction in water supplies and everything, uh, the, the uh, prospects for Putting up cane feed or what have you is quite dismal, to be honest. One of the things we wanted to talk about was body condition, and that's something you say is very important, especially this time of the year. Absolutely. It's incumbent on producers to to keep an eyeball on on the body condition of their cows. I mean, we're talking uh, calves by side of the cow, or if not four, maybe five months of age. The cows are well into their first trimester of pregnancy by now. It's important to to monitor the condition of the cows and look six months ahead and and gauge uh, if we're keeping cows in at least a body condition five, hopefully this time of year, they're still lactating. So it's kind of pulling a lot of taking the wind out of their sails in terms of accumulating any body condition. But it's, it's important to keep an eye on those cows and have the ability, if you will, to, uh, pull the trigger when you start to see the, uh, a reduction in body condition in those cows, especially with uh, incoming uh, fall and winter for those animals. When you say pull the trigger, what are you talking about in terms of adding additional supplementation? That That's one option if a producer has uh, the means to justify it. Uh, we've talked in previous webinars here at K-State about uh, following the marketing uh, of these animals and determining uh, the most opportune times to determine the, the value of your calf crop. Certainly, some alternative day supplementation just to, uh, there's got to be forage out there for those animals to utilize that, that supplement. But to, to take a good look at that and determine if the calves need to be weaned from the cows is, is certainly uh, should be in the back of a producer's mind if they're in a drought like situation in their area. So it's not only watching the body condition, but also watching the condition of the market. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, all those factors are coming together. And if your listening audience would look at the drought monitor, it's it's rather strange. I mean, here in the in the Manhattan area, certainly down towards Council Grove to the uh, almost to the uh, Missouri line, it looks fairly normal, even into South Central Kansas. But there's huge pockets of abnormally dry conditions, if not moderate and severe, as we move further west. So. You know, our cow-calf operators located in those areas, are I'm sure they, they would tell you that we're dry. And uh, they just need to be thinking ahead, if you will, to, to pull the trigger if necessary, albeit from the marketing conditions or from the grass conditions that are on their operations. In terms of what they can do for supplementation, what would be some options that might be more affordable? Availability is another question, too. It depends on their situation. If if there's available grass, if there's some available grass, utilizing a supplement that, you know, even even using a little bit of corn, and I, I limit that to not more than, say, two, if not four pounds per head per day for cows, and I'm speaking specific to cows, you don't want to set the, the ruminal conditions in terms of the utilization of the grass that might be out there just to provide, augment some energy to those animals. Protein, with our declining grass quality now, as our summer season progresses, we're going to see a decline in crude protein. So, again, depending upon the draw that the calf is having upon the cow in terms of body condition, I'd make that decision there. Is there a limit to what you can put on the pasture then? Well, certainly, if, if, uh, if there's a reduction in moisture available for those pastures, a lot of producers are really starting to thin their their grazing pressure on these pastures. And, of course, it comes to that point where you have to start to uh, market those animals or find alternative locations that might have availability for grass. And given our market conditions with COVID and everything, a lot of heavyweight yearlings and everything are, are occupying a lot of our, our grass areas. So it, it's really a tough time for, for our, our industry when you factor drought into the situation. Yeah, you factor in the, the drought condition, the, the COVID situation, and it's kind of a perfect storm for not being good for producers right now. Yes, unfortunately. And, and uh, I, I guess our message here at K-State is our ag economists have an excellent, uh, at agmanager.info, there's some excellent information there. And I'm a huge fan of beefbasis.com. It allows producers to look to the future in terms of the taking into account the, the corn futures and our feeder futures and looking at the value of these calves and, if necessary, to start determining at what trigger point, if you will, they, they're going to begin to market their calves. I think what I'm hearing you saying is we need to be thinking about having the right size herd for the operation and what we can support with the forages that we have available. Absolutely, and that's a challenge our producers deal with from a year-to-year basis, Jeff, and unfortunately, it's, it, the situation has created a backlog with the COVID for a lot of uh, demand for lower energy rations to slow down our heavier animals, and that's putting a lot of pressure on our availability of a lot of our traditional forages that are destined for many of our cow-calf operations. If you do the route of going with more supplementation, you're also going to run into extra labor costs as well as feed costs then? Yes, all those things have a direct bearing on, on the, the indirect costs, delivery of the supplement, everything. Everything has an impact on increasing the cost. Ideally, in a, in a normal year, we rely almost 100% on the standing grass reserves that we have. And as I pointed out, any reduction in any grass supplies, we have to start thinking about augmenting the needs of those cows. And lactation is an incredible energy demand on that beef cow. And reducing or by early weaning of those calves removes the lactation energy requirement for those cows. And so we begin to conserve body condition, the flesh, if you will, for those cows as we enter into the October, November, December time frame. This is a situation where they're going to have to monitor closely, and as you've been saying several times, know when to pull the trigger. Are there some signs that it may be time to pull the trigger? Well, for some operations, again, I mean, if we got a February-born calf, you know, that calf is approaching roughly five months of age, and peak lactation occurs typically about six to eight weeks post 
calving. So those cows, again, with the declining quality of the grass, uh, we're starting to see a reduction in milk production. The calf is starting to graze too, so there's additional grazing pressure from that growing calf on the grazing resources as well. So all those factors together, what are the signs, grass availability, uh, how closely the cattle are grazing together? It depends on what portion of the state we're talking about. If we're into more of the short grass in the western part of our state, it's looking rather sparse. It's just important, it's critical that we uh, determine. I mean, uh, starting to see a slide in body condition is really a key barometer, a touch point, if you will, that I would be looking at. And for a producer that's viewing their cattle almost on a daily basis, it's really hard to see subtle changes in the herd. And I always recommend that outside observers look at the cows and, and give a real objective view of what the condition of those cows look like. And you know, we're always reluctant to have to do something that we're not really wanting to do. And sometimes we may run into a period of time where we're maybe two or three or even one month, we should have done something before then at that point. So again, observe body condition, keep a close handle on that. Perhaps separating cows by age, younger age females have a higher energy requirement. There's some strategies there perhaps to beyond early weaning, we can we can start to put the younger age cattle in one pasture and maintain the more mature cows in another. And perhaps the supplementation for those younger age cows would lead more for a, a positive outcome into the future, especially the challenges of getting those cattle rebred next spring, making sure that when they calve, they're at least a body condition five. And certainly for our younger age females, ideally a body condition six. That's K-State beef cattle specialist Dale Blossy a webinar that will help Kansas beef cattle producers prepare to manage and reduce the impacts of drought and reduced forage availability is being hosted from noon until 1 today by the Kansas State University Animal Sciences and Industry Department and K-State Research and Extension via Zoom. The link for that webinar can be found at asi.ksu.edu. This is Agriculture Today. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today. K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth is getting calls from soybean growers asking about early season pests. And he says there are signs of burrowing bugs and false chinch bugs, which both typically appear shortly after growers apply a herbicide to control weeds around their soybean fields. Jeff, you're getting a lot of questions about soybeans and insect problems within, or, or at least questions about whether it's a problem or not. Yes, In the last couple of weeks, I've gotten quite a few questions about early season pests in soybeans. And it's kind of interesting because every year I get questions about burrowing bugs and false chinch bugs in soybeans or sorghum or other crops also. But I can always tell when I start getting those questions, that means most of the guys are out spraying Roundup on their soybeans and killing the weeds because burrowing bugs and false chinch bugs are common all across the state, but they're generally found in weed species. So when you spray a herbicide on the weeds, you kill their natural food source, they're going to come over to whatever's in the field, whether it's, in this case, soybeans or, you know, another couple of weeks, it'll be sorghum. And burrowing bugs are often confused with stink bugs, but the adult is a shiny black, very small, probably about half the size of of a stink bug, but the the nymphs, the immatures, are different color. They're, they're not shiny black. They can be red, multi red and black, or actually they can build up in patches or spots in the thousands. The same with a false chinch bug. The difference between a chinch bug and a false chinch bug, false chinch bugs, they're a little smaller. The adult doesn't have the white, we always call it a white crisscross marking because of the wings on the back. The Immature or nymph chinch bug is gray or reddish colored, but the immature or nymph 
Paul's chest bug is just kind of a tan color. So they're easy to tell apart, but again, burrowing bugs and false chins bugs literally can be in the thousands in small patches in areas in the field. And they're sucking insects, so they will suck the juice out of the plant. So normally, you know, if you've got good rains, it's not going to hurt anything. If you've got irrigation, it's not going to hurt anything. And real and truly, I've never, ever seen them actually, even in the thousands, even where they weren't treated, even under uh, stress conditions, I've really never seen them cause a problem. Now, they can aggregate or congregate, like I said, by the thousands in small areas, but generally in two or three days, they dissipate. They go someplace else, and they really don't have any lasting effect, or at least I've never seen one on soybeans or sorghum, for that matter, when you, you, know, when you start talking about sorghum. Now, a couple of the problem insects that I am kind of worried about are grasshoppers and the bean leaf beetle right now. The grasshoppers are just coming on, or they have been for the last couple of weeks. They overwinter as eggs in weedy areas of the field or borders of the field or places like that. That's where the eggs were laid last, you know, August, September, and they've been hatching for the last couple of weeks. So if you do have a lot of small grasshoppers, right now is the time to treat them. They're probably not in the field, but if you're walking to the field, going through the border weedy areas or grass areas, and you get grasshoppers hopping on your boots or your shoes, now's the best time to treat if you decided it's justified because they're not as mobile, they're small, they're a lot easier to kill, you use a lot less insecticide, and you get them before they actually move out into the crops. Any insecticide preferred? Well, we've not had a problem killing grasshoppers with insecticides. Anything with grasshopper on the label works pretty well as long as they're small. Once they, and you use enough carrier to get it to where the grasshoppers are, you got to remember these insecticides are contact insecticides, so they have to contact. Now, once the grasshoppers get larger, they become more mobile, and they move around more, so it becomes a little more difficult to tell if you're actually killing them or not. But any any of the insecticides with grasshopper on the label should do pretty well now while they're small. The other defoliator right now that I've gotten a few calls about and we'll start seeing more of are bean leaf beetles. Bean leaf beetles, in my mind, are very distinctively colored but they can be confused with lady beetles. There's two color phases of bean leaf beetle, kind of a tan and a pink phase, but they have a black border around their back with six black spots. Lady beetles don't, but the, there are pink or you know orange lady beetles, and sometimes those are confused with the reddish phase of the bean leaf beetle. Lady beetles are good. Bean leaf beetles, probably not. But again, they're defoliators this time of year. So if, if you're going to treat them, Generally, we go by defoliation. So if you got oh, six or eight bean leaf beetles in soybeans that are less than four trifoliates and they're causing you know, 40 to 50 percent damage during the vegetative stage, that might justify treatment. If they're in the reproductive stage and you've got quite a bit of defoliating, maybe 20 to 25 percent defoliation. But there are other insects out there that are going to be infesting the fields and they're going to be adding to that defoliation at least they normally do you know so I, I always hesitate to recommend treating early on because soybeans are really really resilient at overcoming any early season vegetative defoliation so they can take 40 50 maybe up to 60 percent defoliation early on under good growing conditions or under irrigated conditions and it will not negatively affect the plant at yield time. But again, when they're out there and they're defoliating, it's pretty showy, pretty highly visible, so growers get pretty concerned. The bean leaf beetle has always choose kind of a round or an oval hole, whereas grasshoppers, if they're moving into the field, it's not as distinctive. They just kind of chew up the leaves, and as do the other defoliators. But grasshoppers and bean leaf beetles are the ones right now that I've gotten calls about. Also, the Dectes Soybean stem borer, they, the adults started emerging last week. There's not much we can do about those other than if you have pretty good infestation come August, you want to note that field and try and harvest that field just as soon as it uh, ripens and dries down enough because the Dectes stem borer is notorious for crawling into the patio and going down the stem and then uh, girdling internally the plant. So then if you get a windstorm, it can blow over in September, October 
before harvest. So those are what's going on right now, at least the calls I've been getting and, and what I've been seeing out in the field in soybean fields. Are there some things that we should be thinking ahead that might become an issue? Yes, there are lots of them in soybeans. There's a lot of defoliators. The fifth caterpillar, uh, the last two or three years, we've had uh, probably heavier infestations of thistle caterpillars than I've seen prior to that. In 2017, we had really devastating infestations. 2018, not so much. 2019, they came back with the visions, and they add to the defoliation because they're, they're not here yet. At least I have not gotten any calls, but probably another two weeks we might start seeing some defoliation by thistle caterpillars. Also, Japanese beetles. I had one call last week about Japanese beetle adults out in soybean fields. Normally, they're not worrisome in soybeans because they're out there mainly feeding on the pollen. Where they can be a problem sometimes is in in corn as the corn is tasseling. Adult Japanese beetles get up in the in the uh, silks and start feeding on the silks so that as the pollen is dispersed in the plant the, the silks are gone so they can't accept the pollen it interferes with pollination but fortunately Japanese beetles mainly confined to about the uh, northeast quadrant of the state from about I-70 on the south over to the Missouri border to the Nebraska border over to about 75 highway on the west. That's kind of the quadrant where they can be a problem as desilking corn interfering with pollination. And I've, in the last couple of years, some of the growers have sprayed, especially uh, silk, sweet corn producers, because if it interferes with the silk, if it takes care of the silk, you're not going to get pollination, so you don't get a good, nice, full ear of corn, and that can be really disruptive. But they just last for you know, a week or two, and generally they're only on the edges of the field because the larval stage that's producing the adults is coming from someplace else. They're not coming from uh, the ag field, or they're coming from someplace where there's perennial like grapes or some um, CRP or something like that. And they're, so they're generally just flying to the corn and or soybean fields looking for pollen and or silks. So generally... That's where we get in a problem. The guys are checking their fields, but they're not going out into the field. They're just checking the edges, and they get concerned about the Japanese beetles because they're highly visible. And they can do a pretty good number on silks and in patches in a field. In other states, they spray them. They have sprayed what I call the I states, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa. But they're just now kind of coming more and more of a problem as they spread west in Kansas. Uh, hopefully, they won't get as bad as they are in um, the eye states. Those are the those problems right now. Adult rootworms should be um, coming out this week. Uh, we found a pupa last week. Uh, adult rootworms, again, can be misidentified or mistaken for uh, bean leaf beetles in fields, the western and the southern corn rootworms, because they feed on pollen also. So keep your eye out for western corn rootworms. Those are the ones that the adults can also um, get up in the silks and feed in the silks. They don't do as much damage as a Japanese beetle or as fast because they're smaller. So it takes seven or eight per year to cause a problem, but they can feed on the silks pretty good. That's K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth with an update on early season pest activity in soybeans. Agriculture Today continues in a moment. This is the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. I'm Jeff Wickman. 
In today's agricultural news, Kansas State University swine specialists have updated their popular nutrition guide with the latest recommendations for nursery pigs, sows, and finishing pigs. Bob Goodband, K-State Research and Extension Specialist in Swine Nutrition and Management, says the information covers swine producers' most frequently asked questions about nutrition and the specifics to each phase of production. According to Goodband, it covers a lot of recommendations that can be quickly applied to a producer's nutrition program and should be able to help people with decision-making on products and nutrient specifications to help improve pig performance and lower feed costs. The guide is available online at kswine.org, kswine.org. Well, it is smaller than it used to be, but the U.S. still has an agricultural trade surplus with the rest of the world. Gary Crawford has more. The U.S. continues to enjoy an agricultural trade surplus with other nations, but that surplus is shrinking. We now have the complete trade numbers for the first eight months of this fiscal year, October through May, and compared to a year ago... Exports are ever so slightly down and imports are slightly up. USDA economist Bart Kenner says that's been the trend for some time now, with imports growing faster than exports, eating into the ag trade surplus, which, after eight months of this fiscal year, stands at just under $2.9 billion, almost 20% smaller than this time a year ago. In May, the U.S. rang up a small ag trade deficit, $734 million, and Bart Kenner says, in fact... We had a negative trade balance in January and then March, April, and May. Some of that springtime deficit coming from the U.S. importing more red meat to make up for not being able to operate processing facilities at full capacity because of the pandemic processors now running pretty much back to normal gary crawford for the u.s department of agriculture the kansas department of agriculture division of animal health has confirmed additional cases of vsv in horses Kansas Livestock Association Scarlett Higgins says that six counties in south central kansas currently have quarantined premises VSV was first found in Butler County on June 16th and now has been confirmed on 42 premises in Butler, Cali, Greenwood, Marion, Sedgwick, and Sumner counties. All premises with confirmed cases of VSV or that have animals showing clinical signs consistent with the virus have been placed on quarantine. A quarantine for VSV lasts at least 14 days after the last animal is diagnosed and is not lifted until a veterinarian examines all susceptible animals on the premises. VSV is a viral disease which primarily affects horses, but also can affect cattle, sheep, goats, swine, llamas, and alpacas. At this time, all confirmed cases of VSV in Kansas are horses, although some cattle have shown clinical signs and confirmatory laboratory results are pending. In horses, VSV is typically characterized by lesions on the muzzle, lips, ears, coronary bands, or ventral abdomen. Other clinical signs include fever and the formation of blister-like lesions in the mouth and on the dental pad, tongues, lips, nostrils, ears, hooves, and teeth. The primary way the virus is transmitted is from biting insects like black flies, sand flies, and midges. It also can be spread by nose-to-nose contact between animals. Anyone who suspects animals may have the virus should contact their local veterinarian, as VSV is a reportable disease in Kansas. More information about the disease can be found at agriculture.ks.gov. I'm Scarlett Hagens. In this week's Kansas Soybean Update, Kate Newberg, who manages the Soybean Research Information Network, discusses how producers can find relevant soybean research. Kate Newberg is joining us. She is the program manager for the Soybean Research Information Network. And Kate, first off, tell us what the Soybean Research Information Network is all about. Well, it's a website that brings the production research findings to farmers directly. So you can get on this site and you can find out everything that you want to know about production research in one place. And that's important for producers out there. And on the site itself, which is soybeanresearchinfo.com, if you're a Kansas producer, you can specifically look at the research projects going on right now uh, that have been funded by the Soybean Commission. That's right. Kansas has a lot of projects on there right now, as well as all the other states throughout the entire United States. You can see every state's projects directly. And you've got on that homepage uh, several research highlights of various projects going around the United States right now? We do. Every month we put on there about 8 to 12 different articles. 
from different kinds of research done in different states. And it's available, you know, as a, as a one-stop shop for all farmers to find out what's going on and how to solve some of these key problem areas that they're facing every day. So if they go on there, as we mentioned, they can just have Kansas Soybean Commission come up and they'll have that listing. Actually, it goes back to as far as uh, previous research projects that they had throughout the years? So when you get onto the site, it's super easy. You get on there and you can select your state. In this case, it's Kansas. They would go on there and every project that's entered into our USB, that's United Soybean Board's national database, that's where we house all the information from every research project, the raw information from researchers. We pull that information into this site So it goes back clear to 2010, I believe. And it's probably pretty impressive right now just seeing what the states are doing and some of the things that are have been issues within the soybean industry and probably looking at the future projects as well, or at least technology wise and other things that they're doing, too. Yeah, that's been a big part of it is it really helps farmers and and state checkoff organizations see what kind of projects are being done out there so that we can avoid a lot of redundancy. It allows us to be transparent with how checkoff dollars are being used in states. And it's a great opportunity, like I said, for farmers to find this information just with a click of a mouse. Kate, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That website again, soybeanresearchinfo.com. That's Kate Newberg, Program Manager for the Soybean Research Information Network, who has been our guest on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. And finally, in agricultural news, this reminder, a webinar that will help Kansas beef cattle producers prepare to manage and reduce the impacts of drought and reduced forage availability on cow herds is being hosted at noon today by the Kansas State University Department of Animal Sciences and Industry and K-State Research and Extension via Zoom. K-State Beef Specialist Sandy Johnson says this webinar is being conducted to help cow-calf producers evaluate the options they have to make strategic adjustments in response to reduced forage availability. To register for that webinar, which again starts at noon today via Zoom, go to ksubeef.org, ksubeef.org. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. Agriculture Today continues after the break. This is the K-State Radio Network. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is Agriculture Today. This is the time of year that gardeners often have trouble with vegetables that are blooming but not setting fruit. K-State horticulturist Ward Upham says there are several possible reasons for this. Ward, in terms of some of the things that we are seeing with vine crops, we're seeing the crop, but there's no fruit. That's right. We're seeing flowers, but we're not seeing fruit develop from those flowers. And so what we need to look at is what type of flowers those are. Our vine crops produce both male and female flowers. Now, those Male flowers just have a regular flower stalk on them, but the female flowers has a tiny fruit right behind the flower. And it looks, you know, in many cases, just like the large fruit, only a miniature scale. So the problem with these vine crops is that those male flowers are produced before the female flowers. So you get a bunch of flowers on the plant, but they are all male. And that's natural. That's normal. And so all you have to do is wait several days and eventually you're going to get those female flowers being developed and then you should get fruit. So that's going to be a short-term problem. Something that might be a longer-term problem though would be if there's a lack of pollinators. That's right. So we're normally talking about bees when we're talking about pollination. So if you're seeing those female flowers but you're still not getting fruit, then it may be a lack of pollinators. And so the easy way to check for that is to actually pick off some male flowers and hand pollinate the female flowers. You're going to see there are anthers on those male flowers. Just dust them over what we call the stigma on the female flower, and it should pollinate. Now, you need some way to mark that in order to know which ones you've hand pollinated. You can just use a piece of ribbon, for example, for that. That'll tell you which ones you've hand pollinated. If you then get some fruit on those hand pollinated flowers, then you know you've got a lack of pollinators. Overfertilization is another cause? It is. Not as common on the vine crops, but it can actually happen. Where you really see that is on the tomatoes. 
tomatoes, if you get a really nice, large plant, but no fruit, usually you've over-fertilized. So normally when you're talking about tomatoes, you'll fertilize at planting maybe a couple of weeks before that first fruit ripens and a month later, and those three fertilizations are all you need. Overdo it, and as I said, you're going to get a nice plant but no fruit. So just make sure you don't over-fertilize the tomatoes, and uh, you're more likely to get fruit. And this is all through wind pollination. Yeah, it is. So you don't worry about pollinators on tomatoes. And so since they're wind pollinated, you know the problem isn't going to be the pollinators. Another cause, I guess, can be temperatures, especially with what we're experiencing now where we have the hot daytime temperatures and the hot overnight temperatures. Yeah, both are important. And so when we have daytime temperatures over 95, nighttime temperatures that stay above 75, what happens is that that pollen tube that is made by the pollen as it grows in order to do the fertilization process dies before it actually makes it all the way to fertilize the flower. So... Too hot of temperatures, you're not going to get fruit. Now, there's going to be a lag between when it actually happens, when you notice it, just because it's going to take maybe 30 to 50 days for that fruit to develop. And so, therefore, you'll notice maybe a month after you get in those hot temperatures that you're not getting any fruit anymore. Now, that kind of self-corrects as well. Once we get into the cooler temperatures later in the summer, that fruit will start to form again, and you'll get more tomatoes later in the season. Maybe even more than you can handle. It can be. It certainly can be. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is often the um, cherry tomatoes, the small tomatoes, are more resistant to this. And there are also certain varieties of tomatoes that are more resistant. doesn't mean that you're always going to get fruit, but if you find tomatoes that are sold as being more heat resistant, that'll make a few degrees difference so that they'll be more likely to produce fruit than just our run-of-the-mill tomatoes. And is this one of the reasons why you suggest that people kind of stagger the planting dates for their tomatoes? You can. That will help having those tomatoes that reach that maturity a little bit different time. We're also seeing some problems with tomatoes? We are. One of the most common problems are the leaf spot diseases. We're talking about septorial leaf spot and early blight. Those diseases will attack the leaves and they start at the bottom of the plant and work their way up. That's not a wilt disease. Wilt disease, the whole plant just collapses. But if it starts at the bottom, works its way up, it's going to be one of the leaf spot diseases. More than likely, it's going to be septoria. That's, that's the more common one. And usually, you don't see a problem until you get those tomatoes about the size of a walnut. And then enough energy is going into that fruit that the plant can't fight off the disease. So what you can do is just use uh, fungicide in order to help control that. And so there's a number of those. If you go to your store, just ask for something that will help control the leaf spot diseases on tomatoes, and they'll be able to give you something that should help. The thing to remember on those is that you have to hit the underside of the leaves, not just the top, because that disease can start on the underside of the leaves. You mentioned wilt disease. Are we seeing that as well? Usually, most of our modern varieties have resistance to wilt disease, but if you're growing some of the old heirloom varieties then you can get verticillium or fusarium wilt. And once that disease is in the ground, it's staying there. Now, you're not going to be able to grow tomatoes that aren't resistant in that same area unless you get grafted plants. You know, if you have a certain one that you really like, if you can get a grafted plant where that bottom part, that rootstock is resistant to those wilt diseases, you can still grow them, but they're quite expensive. Anything else we might be seeing right now? There's a couple of things. We have, oh, blossom end rot and physiological leaf roll. Those two problems are caused by the same thing. When those tomatoes start growing in the spring, you get a lot of top growth, but that root system doesn't develop very fast. So when it's cool and moist, the plant's fine. It can keep up. When it turns hot and dry, that root system can no longer keep up. And therefore, what happens is that the water that carries the nutrients goes to the leaves first, and it bypasses the fruit. And therefore, you can get a lack of calcium in that fruit, and it's going to be on the bottom side of that tomato where it just kind of collapses and has kind of a brown leathery look. It's caused by a lack of calcium, not necessarily lack of calcium in the soil, but a lack of calcium because the water is going to the leaves instead of to the fruit. The leaf roll is kind of the same thing, except that root system can't keep up. And so in order to conserve water, the tomato will curl those leaves, almost like make them like a tube. It's there to conserve water. When that root system catches up, the problem will correct itself. So both are 
caused by just that plant adapting to those hot, dry conditions. And so you just do a good job of watering. Don't damage the root system by hoeing too deep. And usually they'll kind of grow out of it. That's K-State horticulturist Ward Upham with an update on vegetables that are blooming but not setting fruit. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. To listen to the podcast version of Agriculture Today, visit agtoday.net or using a podcast app on your mobile device, type these search keywords, Agriculture Today Kansas and you'll find this program. Tap the subscribe button, and brand new episodes of Agriculture Today will automatically load to your device. I'm Jeff Wickman, and this is the K-State Radio Network.